All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Yeah, indeed. So today I'm going to be talking about um, how we supported uh, or how we support Docker uh, in Gitpod workspaces. And to do that, we first have to talk about what is Gitpod. And Gitpod is a system, a service that provides automated dev environments. So it can provision development environments um, based on some repository or any repository really. Um, you get a full-blown Linux terminal like a uh, container that you can work within, get a full-blown IDE, uh, Thea or VS Code. Uh, and you can get a fresh workspace for pretty much every task you wanna work on. And this really just removes um, all sort of configuration effort that goes with setting up a dev environment. And behind the scenes, uh, Gitpod workspaces really are Kubernetes pods. So when you start a workspace, what we do is we schedule a pod for you. And we would like that workspace, that pod to feel like, uh, like your local workspace, uh, sorry, like your local laptop right, like your local machine, except that you get a new machine that is already fully set up for every task you're working on. So no clutter, no old state, no dangling libraries or wrong versions. And until now, something that didn't feel quite right compared to your local machine is that you didn't have root, right? So you couldn't just do apt-get install something. You also couldn't run Docker, which in a cloud native environment is a bit of a problem. You also couldn't do Docker build until recently. And so this is about how we made those things work in a Gitpod workspace. So now, I mean, it's kind of taken by the title, but now these things are possible. So you can do sudo up, get something. Uh, you can do Docker run something. And we're going to see a, de a demo of this later on. So how do we make this work? And the most naive possible way of building this is simply running those workspace pods or the workspace container as UID zero and giving you all the privileges, right? But clearly this is not a good option because naturally it would mean that you would actually be UID zero on the node and um, you would have privileges far beyond what you should have on a workspace, uh, on a virtual machine that is shared with say 25 other users. So the way the core to making this work is user namespaces. And what user namespaces do is they map a UID inside this namespace to a different UID outside of the namespace. So in this example, if inside the user namespace where UID zero in the workspace container and subsequently on the node, we would be or could be UID 1000. And with user namespaces also comes a full set of privileges, meaning that there are a lot more things that you can do within this namespace than what you could do outside of it. Concretely, what this means is that if you're looking at the file system, then on the workspace, it they have the UID 33333. And this is how they look like from within the workspace. And on the node, they actually have 133332, so a different UID. There's some shift, some mapping going on. And the same goes for processes. Suppose inside this username based workspace, you had this process running sleep1234 as root or supposed root. Then on the node, it can have a different UID, in this case, 33333. So how does this work? How do you create a username space? And there are a bunch of, of ways of doing that, a bunch of syscalls that can create those. In this case, we'll look at Unshare. So Unshare creates a, uh, can create a new username space. Then we have to establish a mapping that maps a UID from within the workspace, excuse me, from within the namespace to outside of that namespace. And we do that by writing to slash proc then the PID of the process that, uh, the root process in that namespace, so to speak, uh, UID map or GID map. And then we need another exact VE call afterwards within the namespace to get all the um, capabilities. So this is all nice. Uh, you can also really look at this um, yourself with this S trace call, which basically calls unshare minus uppercase U, which creates the user namespace. <coughs> 
minus r, which maps your current user to the root user. And then the s trace in front prints the relevant syscalls as they happen. Now, in a Kubernetes pod, this is somewhat difficult because in order to write to the UID map and GID map, you need quite far ranging capabilities in the outer namespace. Specifically, you need CAP sysadmin. And, excuse me, because there is no user namespace in uh, user namespace support in Kubernetes yet, and that's something that Kinfolk is also uh, very actively working on, but it doesn't exist yet. So the uh, CAP sysadmin that you would need here would mean you would need CAP sysadmin on the node, right? And this is clearly not something that we would want to uh, give arbitrary workloads on our machines. So how do we sort this? The root process that we start inside a workspace container is something that we call supervisor. And supervisor ring zero then creates the username space using the unshare syscall and starts supervisor ring one. And supervisor ring one makes a gRPC call to a daemon set that also has a pod deployed on that node, which we call workspace daemon. And then workspace daemon has enough privileges to actually write to the UID map and GID map files. So we basically solve this capability issue by just offloading the privileged operation to a service that actually has those privileges. There's one minor problem though. And that is that the PID that we want to write to from what the what we see within the container is not the PID that this privileged process would see. As you all know, containers are in essence a collection of namespaces and other isolation uh, means of isolation. And one of those namespaces is a PID namespace. And this is the reason that PID one within a container is a different process than what PID one on the node would be. So you would expect PID one to be something like init or system D, but within your container, it's clearly the process um, that you started the container with. And this is because of the PID namespace. So what we need is some means of translating this PID, in this case two, to the PID on the node, because workspace daemon lives in the PID names in the root PID namespace of the node. And Surprisingly, there isn't a syscall to do that or something like this. There are there's some trickery around Unix pipes where in some messages you get some automatic automatic translation. Um, what we do is we look at the status files of um, processes. So within the status file of any process, you will find a an NSP ID entry that tells you the PID of this process in any child namespaces of the one that you're looking from. And because we know that the process that we're looking for must be a child process of the container process, and we know from which container we made this call, we can look at all the children of this container process, look at the um, NSP ID entries in the status files, and if we find the matching PID, we found our process. Nice, so now we have this PID mapping done, we can write to the UID and GID map, thereby establishing that within the username space, and uh, can create a username space this way. But what we're left with now is a problem that the processes inside this username space don't see their file system correctly anymore, so to speak. So any process, excuse me, any UID that does not have a mapping within the user namespace will be shown as 65,534. And in this case, we have uh, also a user on the file system that actually is mapped correctly to UID zero. So to illustrate this point, what we would like to see as our root file system, for example, within the username space is what you see on the left. We would like to see everything belonging to UID zero, and then some files belong to some other users. In this case, 33333. In this example, the user namespace establishes a mapping from ID zero within the namespace to ID 10,000 outside and from 33333 to 43333. So basically plus 10,000. So in order to see on within, from within the user namespace, 
this is what we see here on the left. This is how it would have to look like on the file system, right? Basically on the file system level, we would need to have this shift actually done. Now, the root file system that we care about here is the root file system of the container of the actual Kubernetes container. So on the node, it actually looks like this, right? It actually has ID zero because it was put there by the uh, say container D snapshotter. So what we need instead, and we cannot influence this, what we need instead is some process, some sort of dynamic process that does this UID mapping for us. And there's a bunch of means of doing that. First there's fuse overlay FS, which has support for um, sort of on the fly UID GID mapping. And it's quite nice because it runs entirely within user land. So um, if you have access to Fuse, you can also do that from within the username space. There's very little upfront cost. All it takes is a mount, but the runtime cost is fairly high. Given that this is, uh, is a user land, um, it's a Fuse file system. So you'll pay the price for going into user land and back. There is also uh, a mode in OverlayFS called MetaCopy, which when enabled makes OverlayFS only copy metadata into the uh, upper there when, uh, when metadata is changed. So without this mode, if you did a change mod on some file, for example, OverlayFS would copy the entire, would copy up the entire file. With this mode, it would only create something like a placeholder and change the metadata there. So what we could do is we could create an overlay FS mount on top of the root file system, run basically change own uh, recursive change own over the whole root file system, and that would establish the mapping. We can do this from within the username space if we can mount overlay FS file systems within the username space. And to my knowledge, this is only possible on Ubuntu. So so far. Um, in, in the upstream kernel, um, OverlayFS doesn't have the username space flag set. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there are efforts underway to, to mainline those changes. But at the moment, this is the state of affairs. The upfront cost is comparatively high because we basically need to run a change own minus R over the complete rule root file system of the container. The runtime costs are, are pretty good. I mean, nested OverlayFS mounts have some cost, but it's okay. And in terms of platform specificity, as said already, this um, really is only tenable on Ubuntu. Speaking of Ubuntu, there is also ShiftFS. ShiftFS is a Ubuntu specific um, patch and an Ubuntu specific file system. And its sole purpose is to establish this UID mapping that we're looking at. So from we can do this from within a namespace, but it requires one privileged operation, the so-called mark names, the so-called mark mount. And once we have this mark mount, we can mount our file system from within the user namespace, no problem. But to create this mark mount, we need privileges outside of the user namespace. In terms of upfront cost, it's pretty good. All it takes is a mount. Runtime cost is pretty good. It's really, really rather quick. But uh, in terms of platform specificity, it's tricky because this is Ubuntu specific. On gitpod.io, the SaaS offering of, of Gitpod, we have control over our, um, our, our infrastructure, however. So we ended up going with, uh, with ShiftFS just because it provides the nicest trade-off with regards to um, upfront cost, i.e. workspace startup time, and also runtime cost. So now what we can do is uh, we can use the same trick for the privileged operation that we used before to write the UID mapping. So this mark mount that I mentioned will have workspace daemon do this for us. And then we'll sort of assemble a new root file system within supervisor, which is basically a bunch of bind mounts and some proc mount. Uh, and then in ring two, which will have its own PID namespace just to hide um, the assembly of this new root file system and all the mechanics before. Uh, we'll do a pivot root into this new root file system. That's all nice, except the proc mount doesn't work. So now we have a user namespace established, we have a shifted root file system, but we cannot mount proc. Uh, 
And the reason for that is that within any respectable container runtime, you'll find that proc is masked, meaning that there are some files that are mounted on top of proc to prevent you from accessing them. And that's because some objects within proc or within the kernel for that matter are singletons. So for example, slash proc get debug will give you some information about um, even other namespaces that you cannot see otherwise. Or um, slash proc ACPI. ACPI might give you access to um, hardware power controls of the actual machine or virtual machine that you're running on. And the Linux kernel has a check that uh, the proc that you're seeing already is not masked. So you could mount procfs from within a username space, no problem. But if the proc that you are seeing at the moment already has masks, then the kernel will prevent you from mounting proc again. Because if it didn't do that, then these mask mounts would be completely pointless. You could just mount yourself a fresh proc without any masks. So how do we solve this? Well, pretty much the same way we solved all the other privileged operations before. We basically call out to workspace daemon, make that one mount proc for us, put all the masks on top, and then move this mount into the designated mount namespace. Cool. At this point, we have root for all intents and purposes. So we can do apt-get install something. We don't have Docker yet, though. So there's loads of, of work on, on rootless Docker. And most noteworthy here is um, Akihiro Suda, who really has done a lot of work in this field and who's really relentlessly pushed rootless Docker. Also, Kinfolk have done um, a lot of amazing work in this space, um, also specifically around um, rootless builds, et cetera. And then there's rootlesscontainers.rs, which is really a, um, a collection of rootless, say, rootless container tech. So how do, um, how do we make Docker work? And the, the key problem here is networking. Specifically, Docker assumes that they have fairly widespread abilities um, with regards to, to networking. For example, creating their own devices, um, modifying IP tables, et cetera. So in order to make this happen, we wrap Docker inside its own network namespace. And creating network namespaces is something that you can do without uh, without many privileges, but you need to create um, some way for this namespace or for the anything that runs within this network namespace to talk to the outside world. And there is a means of doing that without privileges on the node. Um, Slurp for NetNS is um, one that has the best sort of availability trade-offs because it doesn't need two new kernel features yet, um, and also performance. But it is a user land process, so you're you're going to buy that um, with some performance penalty. But now we have a network namespace that we can run Docker in. Um, but Docker will also need to mount proc, right? So Docker will start new containers, and those new containers will also want to have their own proc because they're also their own PID namespace. And in order to uh, make things match up, you need you need a proper proc mount in there. And we cannot just mount proc for the same reason we couldn't do that before because proc still is masked. In order to make this happen, we simply reuse the mount proc that we had used for the workspace container. Now, we need to hook into the right place, so to speak, in order to do that. And what we do here is we register basically a run C facade. Normally run C would just mount proc, but what we do is we have this git pod run C facade, which modifies the OCI runtime spec um, before it's passed to run C and adds a OCI lifecycle hook, then passes it on to run C and uh, run C will call this hook, which in turn will call workspace daemon to actually mount the proc file system. All right, at this point we have root and uh, Docker in our workspace. And now I hope that the demo gods are, uh, mean well. So here I'm on, um, on Awesome Compose, which is a um, Git repository for Docker Compose examples and awesome projects. 
And I'm just going to start a Gitpod workspace on that. And there are several ways how I could do that. I could just prefix this URL with gitpod.io slash hash. Or I could click this Gitpod button, which comes by virtue of a browser extension I've installed. So if I do that, it's going to start a workspace. I already have one running, just in case this one for some reason doesn't work. That's looking good. So right now, initializing workspace means it did a Git clone in essence. And here's my workspace. So what happened behind the scenes is we started a new Kubernetes pod, we cloned the content, uh, and then started the IDE. And so now I, in here, for example, have, have these Docker Compose files. Uh, for some reason, the um, language server doesn't like this one, but so be it. So now what I can do is I can play around in the terminal a bit. So for example, I could do apt-get install mc, and it will do that no problem. Right, so I can actually uh, install things um, in my running workspace. That's rather nice. I can also start Docker, and we have our own command, uh, docker up, which basically does this um, network namespace and run C facade process that I just spoke about. So if I run that, it will start Docker. And now in a new terminal, I can just go to uh, WordPress MySQL, for example. If I started it like that, it wouldn't just work. That is because here it's trying to expose port 80. And in order to expose port 80 within the workspace, we would need um, a capnet bind, I believe, which we don't have. So I'm just changing this to 8080. Within the WordPress container, within the Docker container in here, it certainly can be 80, no problem, thanks to the uh, network namespace. So if I do Docker Compose up, we're pulling the, uh, the database image. And this is also something that's really nice because this workspace runs in the cloud. Um, it is super fast, right? So the, the pull times are massively quicker than what I could do locally. So now we're extracting the, the WordPress image. That just takes a short second. Uh, and then we'll have uh, basically full run Docker Compose. So what this did is on pretty much any GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket repository, I can just start a workspace um, already fully set up with all the tools and uh, in there interact with Docker, including Docker Compose. So it's creating the containers. That one's up and running. And now it found that um, the service on 8080 that we set up here came up. So if I open the preview on that one, uh, the database isn't running yet, which probably means that uh, WordPress isn't running yet. There we are, the DB is doing something. There we are, WordPress is up and running, All right? So, so much for the demo. Obviously you can also, um, you can also just use Docker directly. You can do Docker builds. Um, you can um, also just do Docker run, all no problem. Okay, so how do, how do we continue with this? And there's a lot of work happening in this space right now that's really exciting. Uh, first and foremost, there's um, ID map mounts, which is a patch to the kernel that basically allow, allows bind mounts to do this ID mapping that we needed ShiftFS or OverlayFS or Fuse OverlayFS for. So this is um, expected to come uh, rather soon um, around uh, 5.12. Linux 5.12. Then there's seccomp notify, which is really exciting. Uh, and um, our friends from Kimfo can, can, tell you, uh, can tell you a lot more about this. 
short version is this allows you to install a second profile that uh, instead of just allow or um, prohibit can also notify some external process who can then execute that syscall on the caller's behalf. So with this, we could, for example, replace all the uh, mount gRPC calls that we needed to patch the OCI runtime spec for and just listen for, or just install our own second profile that if someone tried to mount proc, we would do it for them. Um, and uh, this way we wouldn't need all this gRPC mechanism. There's also um, seccomp fd, which is really handy because this way we could, for example, establish the um, network namespace without the need for a user land process. It will work very similarly to like in combination with seccomp notify. So when we create this, this network namespace, um, we could then use um, another call or make a syscall that would create the, the ethernet devices and seccomp notify would realize that this is what we're trying to do. And then we would have some other process that would create those V Ethernet devices for us and then use AdFD uh, to put them in place. There's also active work on this going on. All right, to sum up, um, Gitpod is a service that um, provides ready to code dev environments um, in the cloud. And thanks to username spaces, you can now do a lot more within those workspaces. You can install stuff after the fact um, using app get install. You can run Docker, Docker Compose, Docker Build, et cetera. And lastly, without our friends from Kinfolk um, and also all the other awesome people in the community, none of this would have been possible. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.